Uh, okay, we're recording. So we are, we're going live and we're recording. So let's get started. And uh, I do want to warn you that I did not prepare this, this talk for this audience, for this conference. This is just a set of slides that I've used. Uh, you know, I, I gave this Java 9 kind of preview talk a, a number of times by now. But the audience was different, and you know, I really want to turn this into a discussion session. And I'm just give, going to give you a few slides. I will skip a lot of slides, specifically so that we can have more time to discuss, you know, what we want in Java 9, what we like about it, what we don't like about it. So, you know, don't expect a full-blown session like like the one that was just here before me. Uh, but anyway, um, we talking about Java 9 because. Right now, the tentative schedule that's posted on OpenGPK site it says that it's going to be released in March, so you know, nine months away, um, and it's a good time to actually to start preparing. And yeah, I'm I'm from a Zool system, like like the logo mentions on the previous slide. So we are not we not Oracle. We, we we just kind of observers from the side uh, for this process. And but so should you be, you know. Um, you should be as well watching what's happening with JDK nine because it's coming it's coming pretty shortly upon us. Oh yeah, uh, so some people have been watching Java 9 and what's going on, and, and um, yeah, there were quite a few concerns. Um, so you probably recognize this guy. Um, he's uh, from, from the Apache community, and uh, um, so he's noticed all the uh, builds being broken in 108. It was actually a case with a multiple release jar, you know, some sort of a bug which was fixed, but then it was fixed a couple of releases, and it wanted to, okay, well, that works, but now Gradle be builds break. So is there any relief coming? Um, and then on another occasion, I asked the guys who are running Maven, um, so the tweet on the right, you know, where, where will we see, when will we see support for Java 9 in Maven? And the guys were like, okay, we're working on it. It's a separate branch, but we don't know what's happening in Jigsaw, what's going to happen, where it will, when it will finalize. We're not pushing Java 9 support into the main trunk until Jigsaw stabilizes, or we know that you know what we have there in terms of API is final. So it's a bit hard to be an early adopter for Java 9, for, for adopter of early builds of Java 9 sometimes, because some make files. Yeah, that, that's probably the way to go. Um, so some guys, uh, so there are some good projects out there, and NetBeans is one of them. And NetBeans is particularly good here because they they have composed a list of breaking changes in APIs, and so this is the URL. So we literally what they, did, what they did is they look at the APIs that are missing, unavailable in Java 9 or in the, in the, in the existing early access, and they just built a, a list. And so it's a really good resource for anybody uh, who is seeing incompatibilities with their Java 9 code, with Java 9 and their code. Uh, they can build their own list or use this one as a, a kind of a starting point. Um, and yeah, some guys are specifically concerned about about uh, Jigsaw, and uh, so here is a one you know, screen from David Lloyd from 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 Red Hat, um, saying like we've been screaming about this for five years, and you know nobody listened to us, and, and, and you know we are highly concerned, something like that. So modules, and we'll, we'll look at those, and that's hope, that's my hope for discussion here to later later today, is that we'll talk about the concerns of what people have, what what sort of thoughts people have about Jigsaw coming in. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, if people complain about things that they use, and this was said by Bjorn Straustrup, you know, he's been doing C++ language development for decades, and he'd been taking punches for all the, th all the things that happen to C++, and yet C++ is vibrant, and it's on pair with Java in terms of popularity. So Java is evolving, and it's, it's hurting beca because of its development, but it has, to, it has to develop. It cannot stay the way it was before. So, um, same thing with C++, same thing with Java. It hurts when, 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 when language changes, but we have to, we have to take it. Um, I'll, 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 I'll skip as far as I can because you guys probably know. Uh, so yes, one, one sort of a side effect of, of a new release of Java 9 is, is that the previous version of Java will go into end of life um, sooner and uh, if if things hold, happen the way that they have, that they're scheduled right now, meaning March 2017, uh, the release of nine, that means one year later, if we follow, you know, if Oracle follows its own pattern of the past, JK8 will go into end of life. You will not be getting security updates after March of 2018. Okay, the, the pattern can 
the pattern can break, but that has been the, you know, what was happening so far. And uh, you might care about it because, you know, you, you probably running your applications and, you know, you, you want to have, have security updates coming in and, you know, your options are, you know, the, these three guys below and one of them it could be for also for financial reasons that you will be forced to move to Java 9 once Java 8 goes into end of life. Um, there are other options available, but we'll, we'll skip them uh, for the sake of this talk. Uh, a bit uh, closer detail, I think feature complete is not yet declared. I think it was supposed to be done, but then Mark Reinhold said specifically, we are not feature complete. Whatever it means, we are trying far hard, but you know, we are not there yet. Um, but anyway, that date actually has passed, but still um, what I hear from public sources that is that nobody shifted the schedule. So still shooting for March 17 for the public availability. Um, all right, you probably guys know, uh, so I'll skip this guy, this slide, so about, about the JF, JEPs and JSRs. This is Mark Reinhold's uh, diagram about how, how features become, how proposals actually become features of the language. So there's a JEP and JSR, and, and okay, we're coming to, to we, we're about to start talking about modules. Now, how many of you do not know the, the, one oh, the modules 101, so how modules are being defined. Are there people here that don't, haven't seen two, three, four hands? All right, let me go, let me go quickly um, so that everybody's on the same page. So first of all, why are we doing this? Um, or why, or, uh, why Java community is doing this is that, well, in the past we had this, this scheme of encapsulation on the, on the lowest level of fields and methods, uh, encapsulating into classes or abstract class interfaces, so these are types, and on the top level you'd have packages, and whatever escape package, packages becomes public, and it was observed for a number of reasons that we need to bring one more layer. Um, so that's modules. Modules operate on packages. Packages operate on types. So there's a strict kind of uh, control. Um, you don't pass one layer. Um, all right, so what's other, what are the problems? So there's an internal problem that, 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 that Java, a GDK developers just try to solve. Uh, it, it's basically to partition this gigantic uh, monolith uh, Java runtime. Um, there is an argument that the module is supposed to solve the jar class path L. I'm sure a lot of you have been bit by the fact, let's say, uh, just a quick show of hands, how many of you have been bit by the fact when, when you have class path and you kind of re reordered uh, jar files in your class path and all of a sudden it doesn't work? Uh, yeah, yeah. But a typical answer is like two thirds of, of the hands. So clearly something wrong. If you, if you list guys that they should be on the same, um, same uh, order, same importance, and you reorder in, in, in your semantics of the program changes, it's clearly a problem. So that's uh, something that modules are supposed to fix. Um, um, I'll skip that part and uh, um, yeah, so, so one, one, one additional um, kind of feature is that modules bring the motion, the notion of visibility um, enhance the visibility model. So, so far before it was like whatever is kept packages will be visible to all um, and, and, and now with modules you declare who can see it or if anybody can see outside of that module if they can see that, that type. Um, and this also closes some security breaches which could have been before past, uh, sort of sealed with the security manager but a lot of people aren't aware of security manager, manager even though it exists since 1.1. Security manager is, is security that's off by default. You need to take care of it, which is not a good security model by itself. Um, so, okay, we'll uh, quickly skip. This is just a list of JAPs, and in it, it, I don't know if that's correct or not, but in my mind, it, Jigsaw falls into two parts. That's the definition of the concept in the language and then how it's implied to GDK. And these are the various JAPs and uh, one JSR that correspond to this uh, so this is the simplest hello world kind of an example with, uh, with Java modules. You have uh, two classes, they are separate packages and these packages are put into separate modules and there is this, uh, uh, this line which basically shows the, the 
dependence module. So one exports services and the other guy requires that module that exports those services. So that's really the hello world of Java modules. And uh, I'll, I'm going to show a bit more complex in, in, in a little bit, but there are new um, command line options coming in, um, both at the Java C. So the visibility that I, that I mentioned before is something that's being monitored both at compile time and at runtime. And there are a few switches that are being added to Java C compiler um, where you define, you know, where, where, where are the modules, where, you know, where are the source of modules, where you want to place through those modules. Um, and um, you know, um, for, for the sake of brevity, I'm, I'm skipping you know, a deep explanation, but you can either execute uh, by declaring, you know, I'm going to run module P module and then, the, and then the package and the class, or you can actually, uh, in the second example, you can, while making, a, let's say, a modularized jar, so jars are now can be modularized, you can actually specify what is the main class in, in your module, and then you specify, I want to run dash M uh, P underscore module, so I'm running module P, and will automatically find that module's demo class and, and launch it. So um, there is a quick start page. It's really handful. It contains examples like this and, and goes into further detail. My personal experience with this is that you create an example like this hello world and try to do every mistake possible and you know you use you, you you miss one of the command line parameters or you rename i don't know you make um, the name being declared in in the module info file not match the name of the directory and see what happens see what kind of uh, you know errors the compiler gives uh, question Not so much a question, but um, more a comment. All that you've been talking about modules up to now uh, looks to me like trying to pack two JVMs into one physical operating system process. No, it's unrelated. You can think of modules as super packages with specific, uh, and super packages, you know, that's yeah, part of the, of the, of the. Yeah, I call it super packages or whatever, but the, yeah, adding another layer of ab abstraction. Uh, I yes. I don't think whether adding more and more and more layers of abstractions to an already complicated system is a good idea. We can definitely get to that. Um, I can't take the answer right now, and even more so, I'm not here to defend or to pro propose or, or defend modules and, you know, that these are great things. So there are reasons why they were introduced in Java 9, mm -hmm. and some of those reasons are internal, as I understand, you know, from, 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 from the makers of the reference implementation, so that's named the Oracle, mm -hmm. but uh, I'm not here to defend this approach. Uh, I'm more, it, I'm kind of telling uh, folks that this is what's coming. It's better to be aware sooner than later, and, and, and that's that's. And we can. I'm 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 hoping to finish these slides sort of sooner rather than later, so we can open up to discussions, and then we can talk about that. Yeah, I just um, want to have said that. Okay, um, a bit more uh, complex example I, I've taken from from JDK compiler. So so JDK classes are modularized, and 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 you can look at various module info examples right in the JDK. Uh, so, for example, you know, we've seen the, the, the keyword requires, but then there's a word public, which basically builds a transitive closure of, of, of the requirements and, 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 and extracting the, and, and allowing me, us to not to list all of those uh, transitively required public uh, packages, but instead declaring the top one, and then, then the runtime will, will build, build that dependency graph by itself. Uh, you can export uh, packages not just to all, but like in the top lines, but also to a specific pack, uh, to a specific module. In this case, JDK Java doc. Um, there is also a uh, support for for the service provider, uh, service and provider. So here, I'm you know it, it, this it, it tells that JDK mo compiler uh, will be using a service called uh, processor and provides a service uh, platform provider with this, this specific uh, you know, implementation. So something we, 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 you know, we used to define with meta inf services, so the, the logical question like why do we need to declare it second time, wouldn't be meta inf services enough? 
And the answer is uh, it's, it's sort of better to, to add this declaration on, on top level, partly because of the AOT efforts that's, that are going on, partly because we want to have a dependency check uh, sooner rather than later, let's, let's say in compile time. Uh, so there are a couple of reasons, and I don't know, maybe Stuart, you know more. By the way, it is it is kind of shaky to stand here with luminaries like Stuart being in the hall, who should be who should be talking about modules, not me. But but okay, I will I will give Stuart a microphone at any moment that he he yields. You know, and, uh, feel free to preempt me from the stage. Um, uh, there is a logical question: Well, can class path and module path coexist? Can modules and class path you know get, be in the same application? Yes. Whatever was in the, the answer there is that whatever was in the class path goes into default module, which is the last option being searched as JVM searches for classes. So it looks for name modules, the auto modules, so I'll get to that in a second, and, 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 the, and, and then the, what, the, what was in the dash CP is something called default module. Um, so yes, uh, so even if you, if you have an old and legacy jar file which knew nothing, or the Java C that created that jar file knew nothing about modules, but you place that jar file into dash MP, then it becomes an auto module and gets the name after the name of the jar. So that's basically a conversion path, that's a transition path, uh, which is supposed to developers who would want to transition from you know, the old way to, to modular applications. Should they do that? Uh, well, let's, op let's, uh, let's, let's have a discussion around it. Um, yeah, um, um, I'm, I'm skipping that one. Uh, just giving a reference to Alan, to Alan Bateman, Bateman later. Um, it's it's too, mu too much detail, so, um, all right. Well, th for the sake of saving time, I will skip that. Yeah, all right. So, so, so to recap, there are named modules that the ones that create, create or were created by somebody else, but they have module dash info dot Java on the top level. So those are you know the modules that create from scratch as modules. But there are automatic ones that those are the le old legacy jar files that you placed onto dash MP path, and unnamed mo modules which uh, which is everything else on the class path. Uh, yeah. What, so there are a couple of tools that can help you to get to, to, to sort of get started. Um, so you can, you can use JDAPS, gen, what is, is it still Java 8, this tool JDAPS, is it still since 8 or was it introduced before? Well, I think the, the tool existed at least in Java 8, but in Java 9 it's, uh, it's extended with a couple of useful um, options like gen module info can generate you uh, for this particular module, what you know, what uh, the requirements and the exports, and you can you can sort of create it and then edit it as you like, because maybe you don't want to export some of the packages that are that are that happen to be in your module. So this is a starting point. Then you, you open it VI, I don't know, and delete some lines, and, or you say that I want to export this to only the specific modules, not to everybody. Um, also, a useful one. I think this one exists for, for, since JDK 8. It talks about all the internal APIs they're using. So, since API, internal APIs are subject to change, almost without notice. Well, with some notice, but subject to change. This is a useful uh, option to to monitor which of the internal APIs are you using. So, this is a some sort of uh, glassfish um, jar jar that, yeah, that I used as an example. Um, there are, if, even if you have a module already compiled, there are a couple of, com of uh, common line options that uh, sort of help you to change these visibility rules on the fly. Um, the add exports and add reads, so, so correspondingly adding, you know, whatever was missing in terms of uh, exports and in terms of requires in the, in the corresponding module info. And I, I'm skipping layers as well because that's, because like it says, most people will, will see boot layers unless they're developing some sort of IDE or some sort of plugging, uh, inf um, plugging application that, that requires to fall from mul multiple versions of modules at the same time. So unless you have that, most likely you'll be, you'll be using boot, boot layer and that's created by default. And uh, yeah, I'm using a few slides from, a few pictures uh, about modularity, so how these principles were applied. This was, this work was going on for about 10 years or so in parallel. And this is the current picture of, of, GDK, of modules within JDK uh, with uh, the current, uh, current early access. 
Um, yeah. Okay. I want to only finish with the with the model. So I do want to say though that the the all three major Java IDs now support uh, modules in some in some way or the other. But like I mentioned before, some of the build uh, tools like like Maven are still kind of catch catching up. Um, so, but at least you can fire up NetBeans, uh, you know, idea and and have a look and try modules ourselves there. Um, yeah, there are a bunch of unresolved issues uh, around reflection, uh, circle of dependencies, and what Mark decided to do is basically hashtag them, and, and, and there's a page where you can follow all the unresolved. So if you have a specific question, you don't know what's, what's happening, maybe it's one of those unresolved issues, and you can follow these links, have these hashtags. Um, the one of the things that was a big bummer to a lot of Java developers is that uh, even though the early versions of uh, Jigsaw were supporting the matching of required versions of module, all that versioning is now just a meta info that which is not affecting in any way the runtime, which is a bummer, although there are reasons why um, the, 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 the designers decide to do so. So if you need to control version dependency, you need to rely on either OSGI or or package manager in Linux or, or something else. So it has to be some sort of external tool. The Jigsaw will not just do this for you. Can you, can you, can you speak up? Or which, 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 which bullet are you referring to? Uh, the fact that uh, you had problems in versioning, how you would version your, uh, your modules in OSGI. Oh, um, so it's oh, so I, I'm not a big expert in OSGI to be to be to be to be, to be honest. I know that OSGI is is on the committee on board with you know, with development of Jigsaw, uh, so that that make, makes me hope that it will be compatible with OSGI, uh, and it's complementary in the sense that OSGI does you know this version tracking and Java Jigsaw does not. Um, but I think uh, OSGI folks will make their you know will make separate. Pr Presentations that it probably requires a lot more coverage than I can can possibly do, uh, with regards to how SJ will interplay with with Jigsaw. I have a feeling they're still figuring it out themselves. The good the good thing though is that they talk to each other, so um, pretty happy about that. Um, bunch of links. Um, so there were t five hours of talks at Java One and almost the same hour at DevOps uh, 2015. JVM Language Summit is going on right now. J uh, Java One is one month away. I'm pretty sure there will be another five hours or so uh, there. Um, so plenty of video inf information about modules themselves. And this is just one, well, this is just five JEPs out of 84 that are currently targeted to Java 9. Um, yeah. S y do you guys care about syntax changes in, 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 the, in the, you know, the milling coin project? Do you, do you care about those, or should I skip those? Um, the small things. Okay, no hands. I will. I'll, yeah, I will. There's only five changes there, and and uh, yeah, and this is the most important one, I guess. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, there's a nice uh, little addition to the process API. Uh, I'm I'm kind of going through. You know, I I'm done with modules, by the way. I'm done with with the coin and uh, just uh, just highlighting a few other jobs that are in. Java 9, currently targeted Java 9. So the process API change, it, it solves the problem with where a lot of times you have to ask the OS about the specifics of the of, the, of this current process, you know, the one that executes this virtual machine, or the other ones, you know, pro trees are processes. So um, there are a nice addition. So for example, if you want to find out the, the current PID, you can just you can ask the process handle, get current, and uh, get PID from there. Um, it allows you to limit a lot of that, either GNI or some sort of shell wrappers that you used to do to this kind of things. Uh, small and nice improvement. This is one that comes from uh, from Azul uh, or you know, for folks at Azul system. It's a small one method JEP that allows you to um, to enhance latency, latency and and both end performance to some extent. Uh, in sp in busy spin loops, um, and uh, it it basically does so by translating the invocation of Java language Fred on spin wait into the x86 pause instruction. The ARM work was somewhere underway. I'm I'm not sure where they are right now. I think they had some discussions about how to exactly to map this into ARM, but 
probably they will do. The nice thing is it's already used in JSR 166 code base in about uh, nine times that I've count calculated. Um, so a lot of guys who do spin weights, spin loops, find this uh, this little intrinsic kind of uh, important. Um, yeah, this is my little Java doc example that I placed there, uh, and uh, like an example of when spin loop could be useful. But for go those guys who are really care about you know low latencies and um, um, some that that's not a whole lot of developers actually. Uh, yeah, this is this graph was actually actually the motivation for this job to exist. Uh, it, uh, the 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 bottom line is actually the baseline. The, the, that's how much it takes to measure time, and the the blue line is uh, the improvement compared to the red line in terms of latency. When you have a producer and consumer both running on the same core and kind of uh, using hyperthread, you know, switching back and forth. So with spin weight hidden and with the pause instruction, it helps to reduce latency. Um, yeah, um, some guys support that. Um, you you can stick uh, if you would do, if you're not use if you have not switched to Java nine, which is many of you, but you know you have a spin loop. You kind of want to have a place lower holder for the future. There are guys like Agrona who do a trick, a method handle trick. Basically, a question: Do you have on spin weight in your JDK? If yes, you know they will place it. If not, it will be it will be a, an empty method. In any case. This kind of wrapper helps to to stick it into older JDKs, so that you don't forget it once it's out there. There's a nice nice thing called JShell, uh, which is a REPL, uh, read, run, uh, read, evaluate, print loop, uh, the one that you would know for a lot of other you know, languages. It really helps teaching Java, and and, uh, and to some folks, it's actually one of the one of the key features. Uh, for those who teach, because like when they show this hello world, they need to explain all this syntax elements which are written here in different colors, you know, and it kind of uh, it kind of defeats the purpose of explaining how simple it is to write code in Java. So right now you can just do J shell, you know, run J shell and you know, bin J shell and then do their system out print and hello world. And then expand that into more complex examples. So, really helps teaching and also helps to kind of to play with some JavaScript on the side. Maybe you want to play with lambdas, maybe something else. Uh, just shoot JShell and you know take it from there. G garbage first by default. Um, there is Kirk here in, in <laughs> this conference who is the best expert in that. Um, you can talk to him about what it actually means to you. Uh, but I would, what, I'm, what I'm telling usually, you know, my audience is, you know, yeah, basically if you if you have not tuned your garbage collector, you will see the switch of the collector, and you might want to capture the ergonomics so that you, if if things went bad for any reason, you might use the explicit options to revert back to the collector that you had before. And also, a kind of recent thing is that CMS uh, is going to be cold deprecated, uh, which is also creating some noise within within the community. Uh, but at least in Java 9, you will have both Parallel GC and CMS. Those are the, by default, both people use Parallel GC. So they, if you didn't care about at all about GC, uh, just what GC is, which GC is being used, that's Parallel GC most likely. Um, a bunch of performance jobs uh, coming into, into, into Java 9. Um, which ones do you want to talk about? And I, I feel like if I if I keep talking, I will be, it will be to you the whole hour, and I want I want to have time for discussions. All right. So this is what I do. I will qu quickly click through these slides. I will return this to this one because I'm VM guy, and you know, performance and VM features are, are more important to me than anything else. Uh, but I do. Maybe some, well, this is unified logging, but maybe some people care about uh, Unicode. Um, seven and eight Unicode will be supported with emicons, colors. Yeah, that, that's what you really waited for. Um, the new versioning scheme, that's important. I guess um, don't be surprised by the change in the versioning scheme. I was surprised to see this plus 20 corresponding to build. Somebody explained to me kindly that this is called semantic versioning. I had to Google uh, or open a Wikipedia page of what the semantic version is. So this is a reflection of semantic versioning um, here. Um, um, a few things are going away um, or change their meaning. 
um, like a boot class path. It's related to modules. I'll get going deep into there. Um, graphics, um, client changes. So here is the list. Uh, great, great to see high high definition graphics supported on Windows and Linux. The Mac came some time ago, um, so Windows now you can use Retina kind of displays on Windows and you and see Java being displayed there properly. A new graphic engine, TIFF support, ultra resolution images also helpful for the for those high res displays. And finally, F4 that I counted the security jobs um, that are coming to Java 9. And yeah. Um, okay. I'm leaving it here, and I'm, I'm I really would like to to open it now for discussion. Uh, one of the things I think on this slide that that deserves some attention is the uh, bar handle stuff that Paul Sandoz is doing. So there's a long-term effort to uh, remove and reduce use. Of, well, long-term effort to remove Sun Misc Unsafe, and in order, to, in order to do that, we need to reduce usages of it. And bar handles is a uh, is one step in that direction because it provides an abstraction for getting in an arbitrary piece of memory, such as something that might not be on the heap, or something that's in the middle of an array, or something uh, direct access to a field of some object. So that's what a bar handle is, and uses uh, Invoke Dynamic to generate uh, generate uh, good code for that. Right. When I first created this slide, I actually didn't know if bar handles would be coming would be landing into Java 9, and I definitely knew that it was following Paul Sanders and others' work yeah. on on that. And somehow forgot to add to this uh, slide, but it is a no, it, no, it, it is on there. It's it is it is a very important. Oh, is it one, there? One one ninety three. Oh yeah, one eighty. Uh, sorry, yeah, then it's there. Yeah. Um, it is indeed a very important change, and folks who are using some misconcept should try hard to to investigate those replacements because one of the requirements for J for JEP one ninety three was exactly not to make performance worse than it was with some misconcept. So if that goal is achieved and you're using a safer API, that's the way to go. Right, exactly, and so I think I think as evidence of that, some of the Java Util concurrent implementations that used to use unsafe have started to be converted over to use var handles now. So that that's uh, I think that's that's the the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Couldn't be said better. Um, so uh, okay, well, so so while we're still silent, uh, so one of the somebody <laughs> raised a question like, should developers think about making their applications modular, or should we just leave it as it is? And I find it hard to find compelling reasons to go the way of you know, modularizing your existing applications, going to Java 9. But I would like to hear otherwise, or other suggestions. Well, so I, I would say as a library developer, what, what Hazelcast literally is, um, there, there are good reasons to go um, and integrate Jigsaw. Not for, for versioning what most people probably believe and where it would be most, most possibly be a useful to normal application developers. But as a library developer, I think it definitely makes sense. Uh, we have a lot of stuff that we actually want to hide from people using it. The same, same idea as, as it was for, for the JVM itself or for the JRE. Um, so I, I think for developers of, of any kind of libraries, it possibly makes sense. Um, for normal application developers, I don't think so. And it would certainly make more sense if we had versioning support. So it sounds like the summary, if you're developing a library, look closer. If you're developing an end application, nobody is behind you using your code, um, you might you might wait, wait with this if you'd yeah. like so. Uh, another thing that I guess m probably makes a lot of problems, at least for us, um, I think the Java 6 target um, was removed from the compiler. So it starts at Java 7, I think, which means you can't use Java 9 compiler for generating Java 6 code, which would be a bummer for us. Five? Five? Okay. Six generated code. Oh, 6 generated yeah. So, so this a quick sidebar here. So in Java 9, the compiler has a new, um, a new command line option, minus release, which actually does the thing that minus source, minus target. That it actually does, for real, the thing that 
people thought minus source minus target actually did. And there's a long explanation for why that, anyway. So, but the fact is you can generate a, uh, in starting in Java 9, you can say minus, minus release 6, 7, 8, or 9. And all of those work. Uh, 6 will generate a warning saying this is deprecated and it will go away in the following release. Okay, so, so 5 is gone already. So does that mean if I use release 6, it will actually generate modules that work in Java 9, but it still compiles to Java 6? Because that would ma make a lot of sense. No, no, I mean, okay, so if you compile, if you compile a Java source file with minus release 6, you will get a class file that, that, that has, no, well, there's no, there's no modules in Java 6. So the intent is if you have a Java file and you compile it, Java C minus release 6, you get a class file that is runnable in a Java 6 environment, has the right class file version, and most interestingly, it is known not to have any dependencies on APIs that did not exist in Java 6, right? But, but no, I mean, so, so for modularity, no, there were no modules in Java 6, so, th so, so this class file is just a Java 6 class file. It knows nothing about modules. Itself. So if I run it on Java 9, it will have module information? Oh, okay, so there's a separate thing, which is there's this whole modular jar business where you can put Java 6 class files into a jar and run them on a Java, uh, JDK 6 or JRA 6. Now, separately, you can create a module info dot class, and you do have to compile that with Java 9, and it's just, it's just a class file, and you can stick it into the same jar file. So that's how you can get a jar file that on an old JDK is just a plain old jar file. But in a new JDK, it says, oh, this is a module. And so if you put it on the module pass, it, get, it, it can become a module. Now, whether, whether you want to do that is a separate question. I mean, you might or might not want to do that. I don't know. <laughs> and other, then there is a whole separate job on module, on uh, multi-release jars, which is a way to package into a single jar code that is meant to run with, you know, Java 7, 8, 9, um, which, you know, there's a job that you basically need to go and read. I don't know how, how good it is or how how useful it will be to people, but it's at least it's out there. Uh, I personally f would rather prefer something on the source level oftentimes. I, I, as a C++ developer, I often miss the macros which we have, and, but, but that, that's just my background. Go ahead. So, so pardon my ignorance, but on the release front, uh, you said it'll do what source and target, what people think it, that it should do. Does that include checking libraries that didn't exist since that version, or have been? Oh, that's actually excellent. <laughs> okay, well, so, okay, so I, I, I was gonna gloss over that, but since you're interested, I'll explain it. So, <coughs> in the past, suppose you're on, say, Java 8, and you want to compile a class for Java 7, yeah. you say, uh, you, you might have said, oh, okay, all I have to do is do Java C minus source 7 minus target 7, and that generates a Java 7 class file. Well, it sort of does. What it does is it makes sure that you don't, if you say minus source 7, it prevents you from using any Java 8 language constructs. If you say minus target 7, it creates a class file with the Java 7 class file version number, but if you use an API from the JDK that did not exist in Java 7, it'll happily compile that, and then when you run it on Java 7, it says, you know, no such method error or something like that. Um, and so, so the new minus release option is, the st is well, and so, so when you, for a while, if you said minus source, minus target, um, you could do anything. It was, it was open season. And I think, I think in Java 7 or 8, we started realizing that people were, we're, we're not using these properly. So, so one is it's a problem, it was always a problem to use minus source and minus target with different version numbers. It, it actually does not make sense. And, this, and the other thing, the, the hidden thing is that <coughs> in order to, to avoid creating any dependencies on newer APIs, you also have to sp specify minus X boot class path. So you had to have an old JDK lying around anyway so that you can point the old, the, the, your compiler at the old class path. So in the old world, if you wanted to back compile, you'd have to say minus source 7, minus target 7, minus xboot class path, Java 7 JDK home slash live, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So, and nobody did that. So, so basically release 
does that. But it actually, there are internal tables with all the, all the past public APIs internal to the compiler. And so it's stored in a compact form. So you don't actually carry around a full old JDK. Yeah. There's basically a simple table that allows you to, to back compile against older versions of the JDK. And if you try to use a newer API, it says not found. On the related note, JEP 231 up on screen, um, which is allowing a selection from the from the com command line, which is being removed in Java 9. So it used to be able to specify, you know, what GRE is it six, seven, eight? You want to run this application with? Now it's the runtime selection is now gone in nine. So I wanted to follow up on a previous topic. You want to you wanna go to the performance piece? I'm sorry. Well, I wanted to ask Christophe about modules and libraries. Uh, but no, so, so OK, so, so quick background. So I work on the JDK. And so one of the things that we've, we've always uh, had a problem with is people using non-public APIs that happened to you be used, that happened to be present. Oh, no, 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 you can't go. Lock the door. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, um, and so, so really the, the, the code, okay, so for instance, so Sun, Sun Misc Unsafe is the, is the, uh, the whipping boy example for this. Everybody used Sun Misc Unsafe. <laughs> but, but in fact, people ended up using, basically they, they so, so at, when we say the public API, there's, java.star, javax.star, and, and a handful of com.sun APIs that were specifically listed as being, being officially supported part of the product. Um, but, but in fact, people would go in and, and use stuff, and uh, there's this constant low-level stream of bugs and complaints and so forth. If we, we change something that we think is an internal API or change its behavior or remove it or rename it, people's programs would break because they, they had dependencies on on essentially internal stuff. And so one of, the, one of the reasons for having a module system is to explicitly declare, okay, these are the things that are exported, and yes, there are packages here, and the classes are declared public because other packages need access to them, but they're not for public, they're, they're not for external use. So that's the difference between public and exported. And so we have this problem in the JDK, and we, we experience it on a daily basis. But it was interesting to hear Christoph say, you know, people use stuff as well. And, and, and so it's something that we'd like, you know, if it's true, we'd like to hear about it because, you know, do other libraries have this problem? Do you have multiple packages that need to communicate using public classes that applications end up accidentally or, or on purpose, depending on that is causing you compatibility problems? Um, as someone who's maintained some significantly less popular libraries, yes, you do have that problem, and also put a lot of effort into trying to minimize that publicly exposed API as a thing anyway, but obviously, yes, it is a problem. I, I think there's also an important VM twist to it. Uh, the fact that, let's say, all the view types escape a given module allows you to do a whole lot of, of VM level optimizations, even pre-compiling, AUT style pre-compiling, which was not possible oftentimes before. Uh, and, and so this is, this is I, think, I think this is a sort of fairly explored area, or at least so it is in the public. Maybe that's something that's happening in the lab. Microphone fail. Hello. Um, a typical discussion point, which is like a, if we restrict this thing you're using, we can give you some free optimizations, which is like, I'm sure VM engineers love this argument, but I'm astoundingly unsympathetic to it whenever I hear it, because VM engineers think a five or 10% improvement on a micro benchmark is a year's worth of work that is absolutely amazing. Um, and that's great, you know, there's a, hard, there's a hard problem space there to deal with, but it's not really something that necessarily makes a huge amount of difference to people who've got a, a production system. Uh, so it's something I'm, 
often astoundingly unconvinced about, we'll throw this thing out so we can get a, a, a VM optimization. I just thought that point should probably be made. Um, yeah. I, I don't know how it always gets out. Um, so I, I probably am the worst person to complain about people using our internal APIs. I totally agree with that. <laughs> That's the reason why I wanted to leave the room. Um, on, on the other side, um, I, I certainly see the, the problem uh, for the JBK, JDK engineers, for the JVM engineers. And um, as I said, we have the same problems, people using some internal APIs. Uh, we're bound to not changing them, which certainly makes it hard to, to bring Hazelcast um, to next levels without even a new major version. Um, so we do this kinds of things in major versions. We try to keep the internal APIs as stable as possible over minus, which is not always possible if you have like a very, very big performance improvement thing. Um, to, to be honest, yes, we have this problem. Um, it would be better to have versioning, as I already said. Um, if we have multiple modules, we want to make sure that you can't just say, okay, I want to export this to a specific other module but I want to make sure that the versions actually match. And at that point, Jigsaw so far is pretty useless. Um, it, I, I guess what we probably do is uh, making the major, uh, the, the core module uh, Jigsaw compatible, but I think all the other modules won't be. They probably just get the information like this is required, but since there's some version support, nothing like this. Um, it doesn't really give you any, any features in terms of, of um, successful dependency relations. If that answers your question. More question. Sam, what, what, what is missing? Well, I don't know. I don't know that much about Hazelcast, and I'm just wondering. I'm, you, you, it might not make sense for you to split it up and ship multiple, multiple well, we modules. Already we already did. We have multiple modules. There is not modules in the same module. Oh, oh, I see. OK. Um, Okay. We have requirements. Everything needs the core module, but in a certain version, fortunately. Okay. Um, yeah. I, okay. So, so the, no. I, I guess what I'm thinking is, you know, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how you, you. Okay. So you have your, you have your system modularized in a particular way for your needs, and and I just don't know whether it makes sense to to map each of those modules into a jigsaw module. And they might not, because you might, you know, if you module, well, I don't know. Um, anyway, so I, I, guess the, I guess the main thing I was concerned about was that there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of noise on the jigsaw dev mailing list now about people who are, who are cons basically this is about encapsulation, which is that if you, have a, if you have a class that is not exported, then things outside sorry, if you have a class and a package that is not exported from, from that module, then things outside cannot see it. And it comes as a shock to many people that even use re using reflection and set accessible, that, that cannot see that um, <coughs> um, set accessible will not enable access to classes that are not in exported packages. And so, so basically you're saying that people are unwilling to fix their design flaws. Well, that's, that's an interesting way to put it. Um, now, what I want, what, it would be interesting <laughs> to have a, a, a conversation between you and the people who say that the fundamental underpinnings of our architecture rely on set accessible. Okay, so I guess I get your point now. Um, I sur so, so the way I normally put it is um, nobody wants to use those internal APIs. You seem to have different um, uh, examples on the mailing list. Um, I used it, or we use it, because of speed. And my my favorite claim is, why should Oracle be able to write faster code than I do? Um, and I know that this claim was pretty badly reputed last year. Um, so uh, I, I think var handles and a couple of other things are are a good fit to replace it. Um, and I think. For, for Hazelcast, at least, it's not a big problem. We're um, OSGI compatible. We take the normal OSGI pattern. So we have internal packages, which are either imp internal or impl.star, something like that. Um, and we expect those things to be internal and to be hidden from users. And I guess that for us, it actually is pretty nice that you can't access those. 
even using reflection. Um, but I agree that a lot of systems I know actually rely that much on, on set accessible and reflection that it probably will be a big problem for those guys. Um, there are a lot of application frameworks basically doing everything like in reflection. Speaking of the reflection and abuse of reflection, really reminds me of, of, an hour, of, a, of, of a talk, it's actually it's almost like a one hour talk from Volker Simonis. It's called How Final is Final. It is exactly about, you know, you declare a final variable, can JIT trust that that variable is final and it's not gonna be changed? And there's a special flag that trust finals, uh, you know, JIT will trust those finals that you'll, this application will not change, otherwise it will uh, restrain from that optimization. And, and it, it, it on, kind of shows the level of absurd that is often happening with, with, with reflection. X what? X table annotation. Right. Yes, how? It's like talking to my manager, I guess. Um, I do want to also to point now that I've, that I've read my, my own slide a little closer, uh, the compact string. So uh, given that how much heap is occupied by string literals, uh, going from 16 bits to, to eight in for ASCII, for Latin seven, Latin eight, I'm sorry, uh, encodings for a lot of times, at least on the English, you know, in, in, in English speaking world, it will be, uh, a, a huge help, I guess, on a on on memory footprint. Um, and uh, it's, it's a great job of done by, um, by Alex Shishlov and those folks. So. I think there is something. Uh, so are there people um, that using some, some internals from string like the char array uh, for serialization or something? Uh, so beside me and Hazelcast and probably Terracotta. Oh, but a guy he just left. Um, so what, what actually happens in Java 90 will change into a byte array, and will some uh, will do some some internal encoding, fast encoding, whatever that means. Um, I guess Chipolov is is better on explaining how that works. So probably you. Yeah, I've done not uh, not at this moment. <laughs> so, okay. So compact strings is uh, based on the observation that. Um, first of all, a lot of string data in Java heaps, sorry, a, a, a lot of data in Java heaps consists of strings, and a lot of string data really is representable in one byte per character, yeah, because people still use ASCII a lot. Um, and so, so really what happens is there's a change in the internal representation of string, where it used to have an, an, inter, uh, an internal char array, char is 16 bits in, in Java, of course, and so that's been changed as, as Christoph mentioned. It's been changed to a byte array, and then there's there's a tag somewhere that tells whether that byte array represents 16-bit char values or 8-bit, actually Latin one values. Somewhere in the header, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so anyway, and 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 basically, it's it's there's not actually any. I don't think there's very much magic in there. It's basically well, actually, the magic happens in the in the JVM because the JVM depends on the internals of the string representation. But from the library standpoint, it's basically straightforward, gross code, which is okay. If this is a compact string, then switch over to the algorithm that does one byte per character. Otherwise, use the the sixteen byte per character. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> We, we talked yesterday about the defensive copy of, of arrays. That's where you, where you have this problem. I, I and anyway, just to finish it off, and then there are a variety of string. Uh, um, oh, actually, strings are immutable. That's right. So, so but the main thing is there's something that, no, sorry. I mean, basically, whenever a string is created, there's a check that's done to see whether it fits in, in eight, uh, eight bits per character. And then it uses the compact representation for that instead of the, the standard 16 bits per character. As, as uh, I, I say, signature here, so it's uh, probably a sign that we are about to close, right? Or do we have? Uh, I, so uh, let me throw this idea into in, into the audience. Uh, there are so many things that are changing and breakingly changing in, with Java nine that my feeling is that adoption of Java nine will be s much slower than, let's say, adoption of Java eight. Um, because of, it's not necessarily of because of core libraries in GDK, but perhaps of the third-party libraries which relied on, I don't know, internal representation, 
uh, or maybe uh, I don't know GC algorithm and then and then synchronization went the other way that they didn't expect, or or um, uh, you name it. There are so many things that are changing in Java 9 that uh, and changing all at once, all in a single release, in a single major release. That uh, I I it, in my view the adoption will be slower. I'd like to be proven wrong. And uh, um, well, at least definitely DevOps and 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 you know release managers need to be aware that they probably need extra allocate extra time to move to Java 9. It will not be as easy, likely as it was previously. Uh, one thing I was going to say, which is something I was mentioning to people a lot around the time of 8's release, but is probably relevant to people in 9 as well, is a bunch of CI systems do let you do uh, matrix-based builds. So you can take your existing project with your existing code base that's running on Java 8 and get it running on Java 9 with everything else in your CI exactly the same, which is very, very useful for finding out what stuff breaks and getting it fixed and thus being able to migrate more rapidly without having to do some big bang, oh, we'll just migrate in a week and then having a really, really, really bad time. Y you seem to be holding the mic a lot. That's why I was giving it back to you. Any, any other ideas? In, 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 in? Yeah, okay. Um, f from my perspective, I think the, the adoption of Java 9 will be slow because there is not so many developer-facing features that, that average developer will pick up. Looking at that, okay, variable handlers is like, yeah, you know, concurrency gurus got not people migrating from unsafe to something else and all this stuff here and like, okay, compact strings, I'll get, you know, better heap uh, and so on. But, but as a developer, I don't get Chinese things like lambdas. I don't get try with resources or whatnot. I, I don't get new new fancy APIs, okay, there will be HTTP2 client built in, like, or I can use Gazilla and other libraries, they do it already, so, yeah, they're just my two cents. And then perhaps uh, there will be a, 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 a what? Where was that? Oh, yeah, uh, perhaps there will be a, 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 a spur of more libraries that will do this kind of funny mapping, because if you are on Java 9, uh, then, uh, then you, uh, then you use Java 9 libraries. That otherwise, I don't know. You resort to, I don't know, Eclipse libraries, Guava, or, or whatever else. Hel hello. H how many of these JEPs require either uh, a class file format change or version upgrade slash uh, JDK link? So, if I just upgrade the the production system JRE to Java 9, w what? Value could you get from just upgrading the uh, the runtime? No, environment? that that is that is that will not work. Uh, the, it, it it and it's actually it's probably one of the reasons why, unlike previously, there used to be a, a so-called hotspot express model, where you could stick VM into arbitrary any JDK you know, six, seven, eight. That was the past. But right now, JDK and hotspot are are tied together. Uh, you cannot you cannot upgrade uh, class libraries and not touch G G GVM. It has to be together. And how many of these uh, um, are reflected in the class file format? Um, out of the performance features, uh, the, uh, probably the string, uh, the compact string, the, uh, the concurrency updates, I would say, the var handles for sure, yeah. Um, so um, a few of these. But I would not try to play the game of uh, trying to leverage some features and, and not others. Okay, we're done. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm I mean, we have to shut down. Okay, fine, it's in the hallway and we'll continue to chat.